Hey everybody. Today is pretend you're a time traveler day. No, really, it is. Look it up. How do I know? Alexa told me. Most mornings when I get up, I walk into the kitchen to make coffee and I say, Alexa, good morning. And she greets me with some fun fact. And that was today's fact. It's uh, pretend you're a time traveler day. So, I'm not going to go full play role play and, you know, pretend that uh, I really have just materialized here from some past date. Uh, but I will talk about, I think, how I would have reacted to popping into 2019 from a couple different times in the past. I'm going to start with, say, 1997. At the time, I was working for Amazon.com. I anticipated making a bunch of money. And I was really excited about technology, and while I hadn't read Kurzweil yet, and I don't think I was yet using the term singularity, I had certainly been reading Hans Moravec and Marvin Minsky and those, you know, that crowd uh, for several years, and I was very excited about the prospects for advancing technology, particularly computer technology, biotechnology, and nanotechnology. So if the KMO, and I was using that moniker back in 97, if the KMO of 1997 could pop into my current life, one, he'd say, dude, where's the money? And I'd just have to shrug. I mean, if he's in my body, he'd also say, shit, I'm old. But <laughs> if, uh, if he came here and he, he'd say, where's the money? He'd also say, what are you doing in Vermont, man? Seattle is the place to be. Well, Seattle's kind of pricey now. You know, if I'd known then what I know now, I'd be a billionaire, but, <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't get to play that. Check that out behind me. It's a very pretty landscape. This, this mode is not the way to show it off. Anyway, if I were to pop in to my life right now from 2008, or say 2009, after the crash, Obama's just coming in deep into my peak oil collapse fantasies at that point. If I were to pop into my life now from then, I'd say, wow, the lights are still on. You have high-speed internet. A hot shower is not some special treat that you uh, rarely get to experience. Huh. Then I'd probably have to dig into the old episodes of my podcast or look for my, you know, my online uh, record. I'd probably go to LiveJournal first and be disappointed at the paucity of posts there. Uh, but eventually I would probably figure out that uh, I wasted entirely too much of my life fretting about peak oil-induced collapse of uh, technological civilization. And, uh, well, there might be some regrets. I mean, if it was all thrown at me at once like that, there would definitely be some regrets. Having had the opportunity to take as much time as I needed to play out that fantasy for as long as it was useful to me and then slowly in my own time give it up and move on or in some instances move back to my old uh, optimistic you know looking forward to the future self it's not as bad you know we reframe <laughs> so I'm a lifelong science fiction fan and in fact long before I think the term technological singularity was coined, and certainly long before it was in popular circulation and use. There was a, a novel that I think came out in 84, uh, maybe 83, but it was based on a short story that I read as a freshman in high school, which I think was 82 is when I read it. It was Blood Music by Greg Bear, and in it, a scientist, a researcher, he creates individual cells, which each, each cell is as smart as a human being. And he gets fired from his job for unethical practices, and uh, he injects the cells into his own body to smuggle them out of the lab. Once inside his body, they start reproducing, and they basically remake him. At first, he gets super smart, and he gets, you know, super attractive and uh, very physically fit and uh, sexually potent as well. But thereafter, you know, the society of minds inside his body, you know, they have their own plans. <laughs> and they get out of his body and they infect other people. And the world is transformed dramatically in a very short period of time. What is described in that short story and later in the novel that it was expanded into 
is a technological singularity. It's just, it's a biotech singularity. And I think if you were to thrust me forward to 2019 from 1982, or whatever year it was, when that story came out that I read it in uh, one of the, the pulp magazines, I would be very disappointed to see that the world looked like this. So, Ed asked me to talk about The Expanse and suggested that I relate it to universal basic income. So uh, I cheated. I'm sure somebody, you know, I was sure that somebody had already covered that. Uh, and sure enough, the top search result is from Scott Santens, the uh, professional advocate for universal basic income. He's been doing it for years, since long before Andrew Yang thought about running for president. And long before Andrew Yang advocated universal basic income, in fact. And so much of what I'm about to say will be cribbed I'm going to go away from this big road. Much of what I'm about to say will be cribbed from Scott Santon's essay. I'll link to it in the description below. But uh, Scott Santon points out that in the expanse on Earth, there's basically three categories of people. There are people who are allowed to work. They have been educated. They're allowed to use money. They can buy things. They can start businesses. You know, they're basically, they enjoy the, the rights that all of us enjoy here in the early 21st century in the United States and Western Europe and, you know, similar developed nations. But half the population is on basic. And basic is not universal basic income. Basic is universal basic services. You have a monthly account which gets filled up with your basic credits, and with those credits you are allowed to buy only approved items. Approved food items, approved clothing items. Your housing is provided. It is meager. You, uh, you know, you don't have any choice as to where you live. The government decides where you live, and you don't get to complain because, you know what, you chose basic. Your choice. And so, to put it succinctly, Scott Santon says that Universal basic income is a floor, whereas basic, in the expanse, is a ceiling. You're not allowed to use money. You are not allowed uh, to start a business. You know, you can't work. You can't... Bartering, you know, certainly goes on, but it's illegal. So, from the perspective of people living on Earth on basic, life is just really, really... I don't want to say it's super shitty, but it's barely adequate. And certainly, it does not take advantage of all the technological tools at their disposal to help everybody reach their potential. Half the people, you, you, you have to decide at age 16 whether you're going to go the work route or the basic route. And at 16, you work for two years, and if you demonstrate any you know, responsibility and aptitude for work, then you're allowed to get educated. But education's not free, and I'm sure basic doesn't uh, provide for, you know, self-education services. I doubt you can buy books with your basic EBT card. And even worse in The Expanse, and this is the really dystopic element, some people aren't on basic and don't have jobs. You know, whereas people in basic, they have at least some housing, and they have, you know, minimal medical care, and they do have access to food and clothing, there are people who don't work, who don't have any money, and who don't get any of that basic stuff either. So, those are the people who got the really short, they got the short end of the short end of the stick. So, is there anything that my time-traveling self would be pleased to discover? You know, obviously the one from 2008 is pleased to discover that the lights are still on and there's food in the fridge and all that good stuff, but... The one from 2019, I think you'd be impressed with smartphones. You know, I remember it was probably, probably 1999 when I bought my first digital camera. It cost me like 600 bucks, and I'm sure it wasn't nearly as good as, uh, you know, this $200 Huawei phone that I'm using to shoot this video. 
thinking, man, you should see the memory card for that thing. So yeah, and also, here's a joke that makes sense. It's, I didn't make it up. <laughs> a joke that makes sense in 2019 that wouldn't have made a bit of sense in 1998 or 1997. How do you convert Fahrenheit to Celsius? Well, first you take the number in Fahrenheit and you say, Alexa, what's such and such degrees Fahrenheit and Celsius? They wouldn't have gotten that back in 2000 or 1998. So yeah, I'm impressed by the uh, speech recognition. I'm also glad that we can finally put to bed that really awful but persistent sci-fi trope that insisted that even into the far, far future, when we've got, you know, we're traveling to other planets and whatnot, that robots would talk like this, that they would have no affect, that they would have no variation in their speech, and maybe throw a little reverb on there. Alexa and, you know, all of the uh, AI systems that you interact with when you call companies and they're <laughs> trying to get you to use self-service rather than talking to an expensive human, they don't sound like that. Consequently, Sci-fi doesn't sound like that anymore either. I do like that, you know, Star Trek, the ship's computer's voice was Major Barrett, and she did have sort of a flat, affectless presentation of the voice, but at least it didn't sound mechanical. All right, anything else? Yes, The Expanse. I forget his name, but the, uh, the showrunner of The Expanse is trained as an engineer, very scientifically literate kind of guy. And, um, you know, usually to get hard sci-fi, you have to read, because the sci-fi that makes it to the screen is more like skiffy. You know, it's just, it's silly, pays no attention to science. And The Expanse is training people to understand certain things about space travel. I love it every time they show ships decelerating, because... The ships have turned around, you know, they're approaching their destination, and you see the, the flames coming out of the front of the spaceship to slow it down. And you can't slow down too quick because, you know, the faster you slow down, the more G's you pull, the more gravity presses down on you. And I'm, I'm happy to see that it's easy to forget that, you know, a lot of times the characters are supposed to be in zero G because you just hear the clinking of their boots and maybe you forget that they're supposed to be magnetic boots. But in some of the last episodes of season three, people in magnetic boots would get shot, and instead of falling to the ground, their arms just sort of dripped up. And you're reminded, oh yeah, they're in weightless, they're in a weightless environment. So even though, you know, the uh, willing suspension of disbelief on the weightlessness thing kind of falls, falls apart from time to time, I do like that they're making efforts, you know, to remind you that there are physical realities and if you're going to tell a you know, plausible story about the future to a scientifically literate audience, there's certain things you either have to explain, like why everybody just walks around on the Starship Enterprise and they don't float, or you know, you, you have to account for it. And so the expanse accounts for it, not necessarily convincingly, not on the, the gravity side anyway, but definitely on you know, how ships maneuver and propulse in space. I like that. So, hooray, the expanse. And uh, as the AI transcribes uh, my speech here, let it be said for the record, Andrew Yang, 2020. <laughs> he won't win, but I support him nonetheless. Talk to you later.